Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending our talk, uh, Zero 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 Day. Um, I don't know if you've uh, heard or saw the news. It uh, got a little bit of coverage, but this is the first time that we're actually disclosing the technical details. It's going to be fun. It's going to be risky. And uh, let's start. So uh, I'm Gal. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Olego Security. With me is Avi, our uh, number one ninja. And um, really quickly about ourselves before we start and begin. Hi, I'm uh, Avi. I'm an AI security researcher in the city office of Oligo. I have around uh, 10 years of experience in uh, research and development, mostly researching AI uh, these days. And uh, I love to climb mountains, so uh, if you want to join me on the trip, let me know. And with me my, is my awesome CTO. Thank you, Avi. I am paying you to say good things about me, so... Uh... Keep up with that. So uh, I'm the founder and CTO of Oligo. I had 10 years of experience, checkpoint, hacking, breaking stuff, since I remember myself. And not like Avi, I'm famous for being handsome or think, thinking like that. And I'm really good at looking at mountains in my Windows computer. So a uh, quick agenda, what we're going to discuss today. What is the concept of port scanning and how it all started from 18 years ago, a very old issue that just keep on recurring and recurring along the years and we're going to deep dive into the history. What is the actual private network access? This try to do um, a standout when all of the browsers should be uh, using, but we'll see uh, along the years what actually happened. Then we're going to deep dive into the actual uh, details of the uh, zero, zero, zero day internals itself. And then we're going to demonstrate how we're leveraging that in order to RCE private internal applications that today are considered uh, um, uh, private. And in the end, we're going to um, really deep dive into how each and every browser actually uh, was dealing with that and the responsible disclosure and um, where we are right now with that. So in order to uh, really start, I'm uh, going to pass it on to awesome Avi because he's uh, the actual smart guy that did all of that. And um, let's start. Amazing. So thank you. Um, so client port scanning. Um, who remembers this headline on Hacker News? Yeah, so why is this website port scanning me? Um, very good question. Apparently, eBay, not some script kitty, but a real company, uh, tried to port scan their visitors as soon as they visit the website. So how did you do, like, how did they do it exactly? And by the way, uh, you will get this recording and we will share the presentation with you. So uh, please try to be concentrated on the presentation. Um, basically what they did is they used localhost and they uh, checked many types of uh, ports. I don't know if it's for monetization, for fingerprinting or for security reasons, but we really don't care because uh, it should never happen, right? Browsers should not communicate with localhost if they're under a .com domain. Uh, it's that simple, in my opinion, at least. So this is exactly what private network access, and I'll simply use PNA, um, um, and this is what it tries to solve at the end of the day. So we have this um, notion of differentiating three distinctive like networks. Um, the public network, which is the internet that we, as we refer to, to the internet, to the internet, sorry, uh, which is a top level domain, like a .com, everything that's on the public internet. Then there is the private network, which is the office, home network uh, that we're connected to. And finally, there is the local device. So it is localhost. Um, this figure is taken from Google's blog about PNA. You should go uh, read about it. It's a, a really great initiative and we'll understand um, why we need it these days more than ever. Now, there are many ways to run a server, right? We have the default, we have 0000, zero, zero, zero or we simply have uh, the localhost uh, bind address. So they actually result in different behaviors, but I'm going to focus on the last two. So whenever I'm referring to a local service, I'm referring to the last two uh, figures, uh, which are the 100.7.0.0.1, or uh, literally the localhost uh, string. So we have a service that listens on the uh, machine's local network, um, the Lubeck interface, and, and, and that's it. Basically, we have many ways of running a server. 
And to understand um, how we found everything, so let's jump back uh, 18 years ago um, to understand why PNA is needed and why it was so hard to solve um, to this day. So it all begins with a lack of standardization. There is no real standard to follow, at least uh, 18 years ago. Uh, there was no HTTPS, like simply HTTP. And uh, this guy posted on Mozilla's uh, forum on the um, on their uh, like security program um, the following headline that says that um, websites are trying to attack my router. It's really weird. Like as soon as I'm visiting the website, they try to attack my my router. And uh, it's been happening for the last 18 years. Um, it's, it's still open. As you can see, the issue is still open. It is being updated, but uh, without the ability to comment or anything, it's still there. Um, the idea is that the RSC should not, like, it claims that it should not behave this way. And for some reason, browsers are being able to um, pass and dispatch HTTP requests to the local network. And after a while, it says that it's being actively exploited in the wild. Some of you might also uh, remember that. Um, real attacks, like targeting home routers. Um, this is how they did it. It's called uh, Drive-By Farming, great publication uh, by Synopsys. And uh, the ability to load the script as soon as the website loads. So this might sound like really odd to you, like this should never work today, right? But 18 years ago, routers did not have HTTPS or self-signed certificates. And the first figure actually would alter the DNS server of your home network using a simple HTTP request. And it simply worked. And not only it worked, it affected like thousands of, hundreds of thousands of uh, home and office routers uh, in large uh, scale attacks um, that targeted localhost. At the end of the day, you can see that all of those are using localhost or like uh, internal uh, uh, Lubeck, like internal uh, interfaces. And then Microsoft, uh, no, no, sorry, then Firefox tried to come up with a, a list of IPs, um, IP segments and uh, address spaces that are considered private. It makes a lot of sense, right? Now, do you notice something weird on this list? So we'll get to that in a second, but uh, someone mentioned that it's not Firefox specific bug, and he's probably right. But he mentioned that it's not a vulnerability or an issue. It's maybe a security enhancement and nothing more than that. Um, and then they understood that they also forgot 0000. zero, zero, zero. And sadly, um, they added it, but nothing happened since that day. So we're jumping back to eight years ago when Google started with the course, cross origin resource sharing. Uh, it's actually defining how websites should behave and how browsers should act when requesting um, resources from other domains. And Google started this initiative to um, try to define the behavior of how uh, browsers should or should not uh, dispatch requests to these private uh, network addresses. Um, so PNA is a standard that is still under ideation. It's not finalized yet. Um, it's being led by Google, and uh, as you can see, it's a draft community report. And therefore, Firefox is waiting for this standard and, ta and tagged it as depends on private network access, which is still not implemented in Firefox. Um, and basically, they wait for Chrome and the Chromium team to uh, define the standard, make it uh, stable in Chrome, and only then they will adopt it to Firefox following a certain standard, but they don't want to do it um, randomly or trusting on some gut feeling. They want to implement a real standard. Now, let's understand what is uh, still allowed. So they started a PNA. It took a long time to roll. It's still not a mainstream component of, in Chrome. Um, it should have been um, available to, in, like, until Chrome 126. Um, but it got delayed several times. Um, and they even had to revert it at some point because they broke a lot of websites. But their aim is very clear. They want to mitigate CSRF attacks and uh, DNS rebinding attacks to local addresses. Now, they still have not decided how to treat 0000. zero, zero, zero. Uh, this is the standard, by the way. It's on GitHub. You can look it up. And uh, they had to roll, out, to roll uh, back some changes, as I said. So 
Um, you can see that um, between some home versions, they had to revert and then apply it back because many websites simply break uh, within a night. So uh, the next time they did it, Google, they did it gradually and uh, very carefully. Um, and as I said, um, they had to make some exceptions to 0, 0, 0, 0. So even although it was in defiance of specs, it was not a part of the RFC, re developers must have wanted it and requesting this behavior. So uh, as you can see, it's in defiance of specs, but seemingly common. But what is uh, this weird IP address anyway? So uh, if I'll ask two different people in this room, I'll probably hear two different answers. And as you can see, it can have multiple uses. So typically, it, it simply means this host in, on this network. Uh, it should never be used as a destination IP address according to the RFC. You'll see it in a bit, but uh, a real use case of 0000, is when we're doing a DHCP handshake and when we still don't have an IP address. Uh, and before the dynamic allocation, we want to identify ourselves somehow, so we have to use some IP. Uh, but this is really the only use as a IP address uh, during like handshakes and stuff like this before you have a dynamically allocated IP. And as I said, it should not be used as a target IP uh, anywhere. And by the way, Windows, I know we all have given them like hard time, but uh, they were actually blocking it at the operating system level. This is why it affects uh, only Mac OS and Linux. Um, but this is basically a, m a misunderstanding of the RFC or some uh, non-correlative behavior. So Chromium decided to add counters to Chrome to understand how many websites use this IP address. Um, so it was relatively uh, small at first place, but we've seen it increasing with time. Um, this is the uh, percents of pages that use 0000 in AJAX or uh, other mechanisms. Um, and basically, you can see that it's on the rise, um, maybe 10 times, uh, double itself, like 10 times in uh, under two years or uh, slightly more than two years. But uh, it is on the rise and it should uh, concern us all. So this is like m the, the really interesting part of the presentation. All of these are blocks, all right? Private network access uh, tries to prevent us from accessing these domains where we are under a uh, .com domain. But when we use 0000, we manage to bypass all of those restrictions and access localhost and Lubeck. So um, it's that simple. It should, be, uh, it should be hard. It should be like uh, terminated in the request level before it is being dispatched. But we can access localhost and uh, 107.0.0.1. Now, everything that is HTTP that runs on these uh, services, including port forwarding to Kubernetes, like some of us are developers, including myself, um, we all use HTTP port forwarding when working with remote pods and stuff like that, um, including operating system services, so everything that runs on localhost on your machine is accessible. Um, there are plenty of default or non-default developer tools that use localhost, and it also enables us to um, use the VPN literally every network interface that is connected to the machine, uh, which was used in the past for DNS rebinding to localhost, so you can use 0000 instead of localhost, and DNS rebinding would still work. We'll see it in a bit. So to target it, we, um, we wanted to see how it behaves and whether it's really possible, so uh, we've built a port, a port scanner uh, written in WebAssembly, web but it uses JavaScript APIs, so it doesn't really matter. And the idea is that he was able to see the open ports on my machine just by the um, error code that the browser returns to the JavaScript context. So if it's a connection refused, you know nothing is there. If, an, if there's an error, you know something is listening. It's very simple. And we use 0000, but you can see in the sniffing with the Wireshark that it use, it's being redirected to loopback, to localhost. And here's the DNS rebinding um, notion. So you have um, a, a, like a subdomain that is being mapped to 0000. So we've seen a lot of attacks in the history uh, that uses uh, uh, that used uh, 127.0.0.1, but uh, it it's, it is possible once again using 0000. Now. 
This gets me to shadow ray. Uh, this is the real reason we started with this uh, research. So after we've published uh, shadow ray, um, which was uh, an attack campaign in the wild, uh, targeting AI workloads in uh, a lot of big companies, um, it leverages uh, behavior, a default behavior in Ray, if uh, any of you know it. Ray is like Kubernetes for AI. So it enables you to scale and run uh, Python applications. I'm an early developer and adopter myself. I really uh, love it. And even OpenAI say out loud that they use it to train ChatGPT and their biggest models. So in late 2023, we had, uh, we've seen this report by Anyscale, the developers and maintainers of Ray, and we've seen four CVEs that were taken care of and one disputed CVE, which is very, very interesting. Uh, it simply discusses the ability of Ray to um, run arbitrary code because it's, an assess it's like an inheritor part of Ray. It is a desired capability. It must have this capability to function because it's a job running library. Um, and therefore, they disputed the vulnerability that enables remote code execution because it's necessary and it's like kind of by design, the way Ray is designed. Uh, an attacker leveraged it to uh, run arbitrary code on uh, clusters that are exposed to the internet. Um, it, was, it got amazing coverage as well, also like uh, it was on Forbes. And we asked ourselves the following question. We know that Ray lacks authorization and authentication. We know that it is usually running on localhost uh, when developers use it. And we try to understand whether uh, our browser can load an uh, external public website, which then can communicate with this local Ray cluster or uh, service uh, that is running locally on localhost. So we need to install Ray and have it running uh, in the default constellation, no special flags or anything. Then we have to visit the website and the website will invoke a post HTTP request to the API, uh, triggering remote code execution. And get this, you only need to dispatch the request. We don't care about the response. And this is the, the whole idea of private network access. So course, the cross origin resource sharing was uh, dealing mostly with how the response, um, uh, which headers the response has and whether should I propagate it to the uh, current context of JavaScript and load it under the current domain. But we're really emphasizing the ability to dispatch a request and a single HTTP request is enough to trigger remote code execution. Um, also important, like important to mention that it's not limited to Ray. It's only one use case. We've seen many uh, remote code execution vulnerabilities uh, on localhost, but uh, for the sake of time, um, we're only uh, showing this on the presentation, um, but there is the full blog at the end. So I have a phishing email, not the most uh, successful one, uh, but I'm clicking here and being redirected to this website. Now, this is the JavaScript that uh, uh, targets the remote code execution. You can see that there's a netcat um, socket that is being opened to a remote uh, server, which is the attacker controlled uh, server. Uh, it is being used with mode no course, which uh, sends the request and will simply uh, return an opaque response. So I cannot see the response. But as we said, we don't really care. We, we just want to send it and trigger remote code execution. And Finally, we get a response. It looks like an error, but you can see that it's 200 OK. So apparently, the job really ran, and uh, um, you'll see it uh, in a second, but this is all it takes. Um, just one HTTP request to reach the server. We don't care about the response, and uh, it's more than enough. So every time you visit the page, it will trigger uh, this specific payload, which uh, just prints the environment variables and uh, prints uh, exploited to the screen. But here is a reverse shell that is being opened as soon as I'm clicking on an email. So on the right, I have Ray running. I'm importing it and running Ray.init without any special uh, parameters. This is how developers usually use Ray. And you can see that it binds on localhost. There is a race dashboard, and uh, it should reflect the jobs that are currently running. Now, on the left, I'll open a socket and listen for connection on, uh, on the certain port that uh, um, matches the payload of the, uh, of the attack. Now, as soon as I'm clicking on this link, you can see that a uh, reverse shell is opened to the left terminal. 
um, which gives me access to the um, local machine from uh, VPS somewhere on the internet. You can see that the Netcat is really running in Ray, and I use it to run um, arbitrary uh, commands on my personal computer. And that's it, basically. It got a lot of coverage, so remote code execution with a single click. Uh, and as I said, it's not limited to Ray, so therefore uh, all the buzz. But it got a lot of uh, coverage and uh, for a reason. Now, we did a responsible disclosure with the browsers, um, and they had to introduce breaking changes. Some of them were doing it more uh, gradually. But the, the idea is that uh, we've actually managed to coordinate all the browsers together so they will not zero day uh, each other by releasing a fix ahead of others. Um, here is the proof on each of the browsers. So the same payload can be uh, used in each and every one of them. Uh, and let's begin with Safari. So Safari um, did an amazing job. All of them did an amazing job, but uh, Safari uh, simply mitigated it in the browser level before PNA is actually implemented in Safari. Um, you all know WebKit, I guess. So uh, WebKit is open source that Safari is based on. Uh, and they changed 23 files, they added a lot of tests, and they uh, did an amazing, amazing job on blocking it in uh, Safari's level, but not limited to Safari, but actually every web view on watchOS or iPad, it doesn't matter, uh, it's all WebKit-based. So they did a really amazing patch here, and great job. And you can see that the, they literally check that uh, the, Andre, like the address contains only zeros. Uh, they have this property, so sorry, but we added like uh, an if clause on every HTTP request in the world. Um, not proud of it, but it's the way it is. And uh, there's Chromium. Chromium, as I said, they are the leaders of uh, private network access. So they proposed a long time ago, when, even when it's only started, to add these headers to the backend services. And later on, uh, like these headers can be used uh, in the server level to mitigate those attacks. But um, they decided to deprecate 0000 before private network access completely rolls out to the browser. And there is even now a report here, and they literally say that it can be used for DNS rebinding attacks, and PNA protection can be bypassed using this special IP address uh, on macOS and Linux, and it should never be used in practice. Right? It should never be used. And uh, as I said, they added the counters and, uh, and they say out loud that malware leverages this attack uh, to specific developer toolkits uh, and again are a bug. Um, and there is Firefox. Firefox also did an amazing job. Um, they don't add PNA right away because it's not standardized yet, it's not ready. But when it will be, they're to definitely positive towards adding PNA. And they did uh, block it in fetch level. Like, who knows fetch in JavaScript? It's uh, the way to do HTTP requests. Uh, they literally changed the RFC. And um, they proposed to block 000 whenever a target IP is 000. Simply drop the, um, drop the HTTP request. And then browsers will have to comply with a new fetch standard. This is the way things work. Now, what can we expect? So I expect that many open source um, maintainers and developers will add PNA headers to their services so they won't be attacked from this attack vector. Eventually, this IP address will be blocked in all browsers. And I think that now people, I at least I hope, that will treat local losses not really local anymore. Uh, we can't make these assumptions of being executed in a trusted environment because as we've seen, uh, browser can have routing capabilities and can reach our local localhost uh, interfaces. So HTTPS, core, CSRF tokens, authorization, all of those are a must also in local projects. So please don't make those assumptions. Now, uh, we're almost done, but uh, a cool thing I wanted to share, so you know these port scanners online that scan certain websites. So if you use the, like loopback or localhost, uh, it will fail, but you can make them port scan themselves using 0000. Yeah, many people forget about the special IP, as we said, a lot of uh, different use cases, um, and that's it basically. Um, and it gets me to the conclusion, which I'll hand back to Gal, and uh, thank you so far. 
He deserves it. So let's conclude what we see. First of all, Avi is awesome, right? Um, he's breaking the browsers, making them actually talk to each other and uh, start to actually build the standard. We saw how an 18 years old bug that people thought is actually already over. The NS rebinding stuff that we all thought are actually like dead already are actually being actively used. I, I don't know if you saw this 100,000 website. I can tell you honestly, they're probably 100% of them are malicious. And this whole concept that been, we've been trying to do for years and like course and all of those mitigations in the end by a simple, super logical bug that just enables everything. Once again, we can see that those um, attacks will keep on occurring. And this is why uh, we think this is uh, a subject that need to be called out. People should be aware that no matter if they do have a WAF or a firewall of a false sense of safety that our application are actually secured behind a private network, this is where we come and show, look, uh, attackers are also looking for those type of things. They are really enjoying from the fact that there isn't one standard and it can be abused. And this is why um, we will keep seeing those stuff again and why we should all as a community really look for other ways and other uh, uh, mitigations on the application themselves, not trusting the old ways that we saw. And um, of course, we're going to have some uh, uh, Q&A, but again, feel free to reach out um, uh, on whatever like X, Twitter, whatever Elon will call it tomorrow morning. Uh, we would love to answer anything you might, uh, you might like have. And again, this is just one example. Um, and you've seen how Big companies abused it uh, 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 for a financial reason or attacker been uh, leveraging that to uh, hack internal network. But the whole concept of just one packet that can hack any internal application, it's a really risky thing. And this is why uh, we are here to really mention it out. So again, thank you very much, everyone, for attending this talk. Uh, we will share everything online. And again, um, happy DEF CON. Thank you, everyone.